I'm honored and pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jane Shaw, Chairman of the Board of Directors of Intel Corporation. She's a talent promoter of women advancing to positions in the field of technology industry. As you will learn, Dr. Shaw leads by example. Let me start with a bit of her background. She was born in England. She received a bachelor's and PhD degree from the University of Birmingham. And she received another doctorate degree in physiology from Worcester Polytech Institute. Dr. Shah started her career as a research scientist and moved into a number of management positions at multiple pharmaceutical and medical companies. Five years ago, she retired as a chair and CEO of Aerogen, a medical device company in Mountview. In addition to her leadership position at Intel, she has served on the board of McKesson and Aero Surgical. Dr. Shaw served as a director at Intel for 16 years before she was elected as the chairman of the board last year. So she's not only the first non-executive chairman in Intel history, but also she's the first woman to serve on its board of directors. Dr. Shah has worked with HR at Intel to support women in the company and has developed programs to encourage more women to study science and engineering in college. Along the way, she has always kept herself grounded, staying true to her values. Indeed, Dr. Shah celebrated time-honored tradition at Intel by working in a 4 by 4 cubicle at least one day a week in the collaborative spirit of Intel. She's a champion of women on the rise and down to earth of leader of principle. Now, let's join me in welcoming Dr. Jan Shah, Chairman of the Board of Directors of Intel Corporation. Thank you so much for that, for that very warm, uh, welcoming introduction. Um, I was actually going to tell you a little bit about my background because you might wonder what am I doing standing here as chairman of Intel. I grew up in the countryside in England. I was a farmer's daughter. Um, and, you know, I often pinch myself and say, what on earth happened? Here I am, 6,000 miles from home in the high-tech world, um, very, very different from uh, what uh, my ambitions might have been as a young lady growing up in Worcestershire. Um, yes, I gained a bachelor's degree and then a PhD in the field of physiology at the University of Birmingham. And when I say that, I always have to add England after it because there's a University of Birmingham in Alabama too. Um, but got a PhD and really without consciously making a decision, found myself in the United States because the whole team that I was working with in England, when you do a PhD, you do it totally by doing a research thesis and then you defend your thesis. Um, and when I'd completed my PhD working with the team, it was in the field of prostaglandins, which were newly discovered at the time. Uh, they're compounds that are found to be pretty ubiquitous throughout the body. And I spend time trying to understand, identify them, and understand what, what regulating function they played. So the team worked, I worked as part of this team doing my PhD thesis, and then we all moved um, to the Worcester Foundation in Massachusetts. Um, I came originally to do two years postdoc work. Um, two years turned into six years. Uh, we were very successful with grants from NIH, from NSF, uh, from what was then a pharmaceutical company called the Upjohn Company in Kalamazoo. And after this um, very successful six years, unsolicited by me, the phone rang. And it was a gentleman out here in Silicon Valley by the name of Alejandro Zaffaroni. And he said uh, he'd heard of the work that we were doing in the field of prostaglandins. And he was starting a new company out here in California um, called the Alza Corporation. Um, it was located on Page Mill Road in Palo Alto. And he was looking for someone to start and help with his pharmacology department. 
So I flew out from Massachusetts for an interview, and Alex was one of those people, is one of those people, um, and perhaps many of you will meet such people in your life, and you say, you lead and I'll follow. He was a very charismatic individual, um, had very far-reaching, far-ranging ideas, and he wanted to revolutionize the pharmaceutical industry, which until that time had totally focused on development of new chemical entities with ways to better deliver those chemical entities to the body. So that you could get, when you think of it, if you have a headache, you take an aspirin. If you have a toe ache, you take an aspirin. So you're not specifically targeting the drug to the area that needs to be treated. And that was Alex's hypothesis, that we could minimize a lot of the toxicity associated with administration of drugs if we targeted them to the tissue that needed them at the concentration it was needed for the duration that it was needed. So I joined this company, Alpha, back in 1970 as a research scientist. And I was given the project of trying to better understand how you might administer drugs through the skin. And I suddenly found myself in charge of a group of engineers who were building, chemical engineers, who were building this dosage form. And if you think about the function of your skin, it does two things. It keeps water in and it keeps foreign objects out. You don't want germs invading. And your skin is a very, very good barrier. So we spent a lot of time working how could we selectively buck that barrier and get drugs to penetrate into the skin and through the skin. And out of that came all the patches that you might have seen um, that you can put on your skin and deliver medication for anywhere from one day to seven days, depend, depending on upon how the dosage form is, is engineered. So in I joined this startup company. I learned a lot about product development. I learned a lot about clinical trials. I learned a lot about managing engineers. Um, I never let on to them that I didn't totally understand what, what they were doing as they would s submit reports to me. I would pick out one piece that I could understand and I'd study it in detail and then I'd go and question them about it and they thought, boy, she's paying attention. Um, and I earned their respect, they certainly always had my respect and it was a, a, a wonderful team effort. The value of being in a startup company is you can do whatever needs to be done if you're, if you're, if you're so inclined. And I learned a lot, I learned a lot about the whole drug development process from the beginning right through to, to regulatory approval. So how does that lead me to Intel? Well, I was giving a talk. It was an invitation of the Harvard and Stanford M joint MBA programs. Asked me to give a talk um, in Palo Alto on the subject of product development. And Gordon Moore was in the audience. And afterwards, I spent time talking to him. Um, you'll, you'll all know that Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel and the founder of Moore's Law. Um, about, they just developed, the, at the time, this was 1993, they just um, developed the Pentium chip. And they'd had a very key group of people within Intel working as a team to develop that product. Uh, now the product was launched, it was out there. What did they do with the team? How did they recycle the team into the organization and keep them equally, managed, um, equ equally motivated to contribute? And we found that we had quite a lot of in common in terms of my activities at um, Alza because we just brought the first transdermal product um, to the marketplace needed to de disband the team and recycle them. So that was the basis of the conversation. Next thing, I'm invited to lunch at Intel and I find myself having lunch with Andy Grove and Gordon Moore and they said, um, we would like, we had a very nice lunch and conversation, they said, we'd like to show you around um, one of the fabs here um, in D2 in Santa Clara. I said, you know, I really don't have time. I'm really rather busy. So I sort of shrugged them off, thought that was a nice lunch. What I didn't realize was that I was being interviewed to join the board. Um, my abruptness sort of with them didn't discourage them and I was asked to join the board in 1993. I left Alza in, um, in 1994, joined the VC world up on Sand Hill Road for a while 
and then ran Aerogen, which was a company that specialized in respiratory drug delivery, delivery of drugs to the lungs. Um, so again, a drug delivery system, but not in competition with anything that ALSA had done in the past. And I was chairman and CEO of that company. It was sold in 2005. And since 2005, I've just um, concentrated on board work. Now, I was the first, first female to join the board at Aerogen. We now have three females on the board. Uh, we have Charlene uh, Barshevsky, uh, who was ambassador at the time that the trade negotiation agreements were opened up with China. Charlene joined the board because she brings that expertise at the time that China was opening up for Intel um, as a country of, of interest. Uh, we have a third, third woman that we've added to the board in terms of Susan Decker. She was president of Yahoo um, before Carol Bartz took over as, as CEO. So we have nine independent members on the board, three of whom are women. The history at Intel has said that the prior CEO will step up to be chairman when he retires as CEO. So in 2005, when Paul Ottolini became uh, CEO of Intel, Craig Barrett, the then CEO, stepped up to be chairman. In two, and that's the, way, that's the way that the history has happened at Intel. Um, with first um, uh, Bob Noyce, then Gordon Moore, then Andy Grove, then Craig Barrett stepping up to be chairman. In 2009, when Craig Barrett decided he wanted to retire, good governance said uh, that we could not combine the roles of chairman and CEO. So we had Paul as the CEO, and then therefore we're looking for a chairman. And I was elected by my f uh, fellow board members um, to step up and assume that role. So I've been chairman at Intel for the last 18 months. So that gives you a little bit of my background and experience um, and how I end up in this position with this title to, to talk to you today. I'm not an engineer. My focus at Intel is making sure that Intel, the great company that it is, a company of 80,000 people operating in some 60 countries around the world, has just the best governance practices it can have, both in the boardroom and outside, and that's where corporate responsibility comes um, to play. Um, obviously, in the boardroom, your, your main job is to focus on overseeing the strategy of the company, it's to focus on returning value to shareholders. That's the second, if not the most important thing. And always to have plans in place for CEO succession. Should the proverbial bus hit your, your CEO, um, you need plans for immediate transition, you need plans for transition in a two to th three year time frame, and then you need to know the management that's coming up the ranks so you have plans in the four to five year time frame. And that's the way Intel is usually done it. It's usually promoted from within, but you're constantly calibrating um, against the outside. So today, I thought I would spend a few minutes talking with you, and I'll certainly tr uh, try and leave time for questions, on the issue of, of corporate social responsibility. And I'm trying to think what on earth I did with the clicker that you, get, you gave me. Here it is. Okay. Um, corporate social responsibility it comes by many, it's known by many, many different names. Um, you hear it called the triple bottom line, that is people, planet, and profits. Uh, you hear it referred to just as sustainability, as corporate social responsibility, environment, social, and, and governance. I like the thought of the triple bottom line. There's many a debate about can you appropriately in a company take care of your people, take care of the planet, and make a profit? Some will say, no, you can't. Intel strongly believes that, yes, you can. And I hope that um, I'll convince you that, in fact, yes, um, we, are, we, 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 can, uh, we can do that. We like the definition 
that Michael Porter and would, uh, gave it, Michael Porter from Harvard, and we would agree with this, that we're looking at creating a positive social impact while addressing the risks and the opportunities of operating as a global corporation. It's important in today's environment for a number of reasons. First of all, there's an increase around us in socially responsible investors. Um, I'll give you an example. Last year, we tried to make Intel's annual meeting a virtual meeting, just doing it over the web. And there was an uprise from, from our corporate social investors and we went to talk to them and they said, you can't do that. You can't, as management, retreat behind sort of um, electronic communication. You have to sit in the room with your shareholders in an environment like, like this. So we backed off. Uh, I mean, here's Intel leading in technology, ideally set up. It would, makes a lot of sense. We're operating in 60 companies. If we made our annual meeting uh, totally webcast and did it over the internet, we could reach all those countries and, and investors that are out there, rather than sitting in a room like this in Santa Clara and seeing which investors uh, or shareholders walk in the door. So it's, it's really interesting to see the activism um, that, that's developing around this issue. We've got changing expectations today as well amongst consumers and the public. And we're finding that corporate social responsibility and what a company is doing in this area is becoming extremely important in new talent recruitment as well as for the existing employees. Um, HR reports that when um, people have a choice which company they're going to join, they will focus on the company that does most for its people um, and the planet. It's, it's, it's just a level of consciousness that has increased. At Intel, I'm really proud of what we're doing in, in this area. Um, it's well aligned with definition of Intel's strategy, um, uh, our global strategy we can reduce to just a one page, and there are four pillars of that strategy. The first is we will continue to drive in the whole area of notebooks and servers, which everybody knows Intel well for. Secondly, we'll continue to drive in adjacent markets, looking at use of our technology in uh, embedded processes, in tablets, smartphones, the adjacencies to the, to the uh, notebooks and server market. Uh, the third pillar is establishing a secure computing continuum amongst all the devices with which we are communicating today to give you um, that personal safety. But the fourth, and it speaks to our efforts in the area of corporate social responsibility, uh, and I'll read you the exact words. It says, we care for our people, we care for the planet, and we drive to inspire the next generation. So that's the fourth pillar of, of Intel's uh, global strategy um, around the world. If we look at corporate responsibility at Intel, we've received over 80 recognitions for our efforts in 2009 at the local, at the national, um, and at the global level. This is one we are particularly uh, proud of speaking to, to, to our role um, in, um, in, 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 the, in the community. Uh, you're probably aware, you see it in Business Week and Fortune, the uh, 100 best companies to work for. Um, Intel's often voted as one of the best places to work. So from a brand, um, and reputation perspective, we've le received a lot of recognition uh, for our corporate responsibility programs. But the en at the end of the day, um, we do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, and there have been numerous studies showing a correlation between corporate responsibility and long-term growth of a corporation. For example, in, there was a 2002 to 2006 study concluded that, which concluded that companies in the top 10% on sustainability score of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index 
outperformed on return um, on invested capital and on shareholder return. So if you do the right thing, um, you, are, you are, it seems, rewarded. We look at all of our CSR activities in terms of their impact on four business dimensions. If we look at risk management, running a company like Intel, you, you run into many, many, many risks. Um, you've got a regulatory risk as you set up your factories. Are, are you under control with respect to your emissions um, and, and your footprint? Um, are you, are, are the community within which you're operating, um, are, they your, are they glad you're their neighbours or are, are they alienated from you? Um, most recently, a big issue which is arising is supply chain responsibility. Um, how far back can you go to make sure that the materials you're using um, are obtained from an appropriate source that are not violating human rights laws? Um, so getting a license to operate and, 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 and establish your manufacturing facilities to get them up early depends... Oh, I need to go back. And I was told to do that, to go back. Right. Um, depends a lot on assessing risk management and getting these, these policies in place. The outcome is, if you can get your manufacturing facilities up earlier, obviously there's a tremendous gain for the corporation. If you've got motivated um, and, and engaged employees, your operations are going to run more smoothly. You're going to get cost savings. You're going to get continuous improvement. You're going to get the operational efficiency that you want. I'm not going to talk too much about what we do other than uh, I'll talk a little bit about the employee uh, commitment um, to helping in the communities in which we live. But we do a lot at, at uh, Intel with respect to employee training, um, with respect to fostering diversity, um, to with respect to um, ensuring women stay in the workforce and that we can cater to their needs as, as they take on extra commitments like families. Um, so there's a lot that we do um, to, to uh, a facilitate um, our employees' engagement and to have them motivated to, to contribute. The Intel brand is one of the most recognized um, brands um, in the industry. I think Coca-Cola is always number one, or maybe it's now Pepsi-Cola. But Intel always ranks very, very, very high with recognition of its brand. And we believe the technology leadership coupled with corporate citizenship in this whole area of corporate social responsibility is what drives our reputation. And one without the other would not lead um, to such a strong brand name. If we do these things, these three things right, um, the revenues follow. Um, you need a motivated workforce to give you growth um, and innovation. And out of many of our um, enterprises to, to better understand the risk, partnerships to drive standards forward, come market expansion and product innovation and meeting of new customer needs. So this is, we don't look at CSR or corporate social responsibility as a, as a separate endeavor. It's embedded in, in the way that we conduct our business. Very important in this year, 2010, a time when companies are almost fully outsourced in, in, in many instances. Emerging markets are becoming increasingly important and how do you do business in emerging markets and take care of not only the US laws but also the laws of the country in which you're operating. Um, and business leaders today are, uh, well let's say they are um, not always respected so we have to work um, even harder um, in, in ensuring we meet the necessary standards. Now let me talk about some specific activities that we've undertaken and one I'm particularly proud of uh, is in the field of, of education. Um, this is where I have spent um, some time, a trigger finger, some time. Um, at, it, at Intel, innovation, as you all know, is really uh, critical to a, our business. And a quality education 
is critical to innovation. They, they go hand in hand and that's why over the last decade um, Intel has invested over a billion dollars in education programs around the world. Programs that support teachers, um, increase access to technology, uh, promote excellence in maths and science, and advance research and entrepreneurship. So just as we make long-term investments to advance our manufacturing capabilities, these education investments allow us to build a human capital uh, that's critical to advancing our business and society as a whole. The Intel Teach program, you see there are eight plus million teachers. The Intel Teach program uh, helps teachers to be more effective in using technology in the classroom. We train them how to integrate the technology into their lessons, promoting problem solving, critical thinking, and collaboration skills. Um, the Intel teachers trained more than 8 million teachers, and our goal is that by 2012, we'll have 13 million teachers trained around the world and 500 million devices delivered into the hands of students. Our investments, it's not all one way. Our investments in education also bring direct value back to Intel. Um, and an example of this would be the Intel powered classmate um, PC, which is a rugged netbook um, that uh, we designed especially for education based on our decade of experience in the classroom with Intel Teach and other education programs. If we look, and I wonder if any of you had a chance to see the Intel Science and Engineering Fair when the finals came to San Jose last year. Um, actually, no, it's still this year. It was early this year. Um, Intel sponsors science competitions, um, and it's done to celebrate and inspire the next generation of innovators. These competitions encourage students to solve problems and tackle scientific questions through authentic research. Each year, if you can imagine, throughout the world, more than six million students from local science fairs within the Intel affiliated network compete to attend the Inter Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, which is held over a one week period in the United States every year. From that six million, about 1,600 come to the US. As I say, they were here in San Jose last year. I think next year the meeting is in Texas. And the finalists all share their, their breakthrough scientific research. If you can believe these are all high school students, 24% of the 2010 participants, the 1,600 of them, already had a patent or were considering applying for a patent for the, the, the research, uh, to cover the research that they had conducted. The lady on the left, her name is Amy Chow. Amy won the top award at the Intel ISEF in 2010 for her chemistry project. It was called Lights, Quantum Dots, Action. Um, she developed a novel photosensitizer for photodynamic therapy, an emerging cancer treatment which uses high energy to activate a cancer-killing drug. <coughs> On the right, uh, we see Erica de Benedictus. Erica this year won the Intel Science Talent Search. This is totally US-based competition. Um, the the Science and Engineering Fair is global. The Science Talent Search is US only. High school students buy and compete. Uh, the, top, um, the top students are brought to Washington for one week. Um, during that week in Washington, <coughs> they, they get to meet the President of the United States. They get to work up on, on Capitol Hill. Um, they spend time um, meeting with congressmen, senators, and their week culminates in a, a gala dinner um, where they show off their, their, their scientific projects. Um, they will display them and the, the winner is announced. The, 
Intel took over running this from Westinghouse. It used to be known as the Westinghouse Science Fair, but Intel has been running it for the last decade. And they've made extraordinary contributions to science. The alumni hold over 100 of the world's most coveted science and maths honors, including, if you can imagine this, seven Nobel Prizes, three National Medals of Science, 11 MacArthur Foundation Fellowships, and two Field Medals. So the encouragement of, of these students has had profound effects um, on the fields of science. Um, Erica won the top award this year for her project developing a software navigation system to help improve spacecraft travel throughout the solar system. I mean, a truly amazing, uh, amazing young lady. And I take no credit for the fact that the winners were both women this, uh, this year. Um, so a tremendous effort in, in the field of, of education um, because we think that's an investment uh, for Intel in the future as well as for society at large. Let's go on to another topic um, that comes under the umbrella of corporate responsibility, namely sustainability. Sustainability is, in fact, integrated into many aspects of our business, from working to make our operations more sustainable to the way we design our products. Uh, we are continually looking for opportunities to reduce our environmental footprint um, while reducing costs and increasing revenues. The, it's a little-known fact, but according to the EPA, Intel is the largest corporate has been for the last two years the largest corporate purchaser of green power in the United States. Uh, we've, uh, I believe in 2009 uh, we purchased 1.43 billion kilowatts of renewable energy credits which was equal to about half of our energy use. And these investments have allowed us to provide some leadership in the marketplace uh, for renewable energy, and we hope certainly that other industries will, will follow our lead. They've also generated, and I'll circle back to the, the four, the four um, areas that I gave you, um, to generate brand value uh, for us by helping us to be recognized as a leader in, in the area of sustainability. More recently, we put solar electrical installations at eight of our U.S. sites. From a product perspective, we're always seeking to use less energy as we produce products and then produce products for you to use that also use less energy so that you get longer battery life um, as you use your, your notebooks and, and netbooks. Another area that we focus in sustainability is in water management. Intel's manufacturing facilities use large amounts of water. Um, it's a key focus for us, how, how to handle that. We work to minim, minimize water use um, in our manufacturing processes, and we invest in projects um, that help us to reduce, recycle, and reclaim water. In Arizona, we actually purify the water after use sufficiently to pump it back into the aquifer um, to, to, to regenerate the supply. Since 1998, uh, we've invested more than $100 million in water conservation programs at our global facilities. Uh, in 2009, we reclaimed uh, approximately 2 billion gallons of water from our manufacturing operations for purposes such as irrigation uh, of the landscape, um, and um, that enables us to reduce our c consumption of fresh water, obviously, in those instances. We also incorporate design for environment, and I'm sure that's a term that's familiar to, to many of you. Those principles into each stage of product development, from the materials that go into the products that uh, Intel makes to addressing e-waste issues. And I'm particularly proud that we, in fact, do recycle over 70% of our waste um, at Intel. So big efforts in the field of education big efforts in the field of, of sustainability, trying to reduce um, our global footprint. 
And, and the last but by no means least area I would like to just touch on is talking about a little bit about our people. We encourage our people throughout the world to be an asset to, to the community um, in which they live and operate. Um, throughout, we have a very active Intel volunteer program. And last year, our employees volunteered over one million hours at local schools and at nonprofit. And it shows here 32,000 employees were involved in approximately 40 countries, um, volunteering in, in the number of schools listed here. This has a tremendous impact. Not only is it, is it, does it feed back on the individual who's contributing their time, but it feed back, feeds back again on the brand name of Intel. And um, these, these people serve very much as ambassadors uh, for us in the community. And their good work reflects positively on our reputation. We now focused on growing our skills-based volunteers um, so that Intel employees can use the skills that they use in the workforce and maybe apply those uh, to benefit the community. And the employees will learn something new in the process. If we're putting up a, a, a facility in the environment in which, in which they're living, they may hear of concerns in the community um, as a result of doing this, and we can deal with those issues uh, well before uh, they become um, a major issue. Now, all of the hours, and I think it's not listed here, but it's a very important point that all of the hours that uh, the volunteers give are matched by the Intel Foundation uh, with matching grants to the school and to the nonprofits. So not only are the people giving their time, but Intel will match the hours in terms of dollars uh, that they give, and they g so it goes to the, uh, to the institution uh, where the volunteer hours are being given. So a very positive impact, as I said, for our people. As I said, I'm not going to touch on, on the training programs that are in place for people, the diversity programs, um, the career development programs that allow them to move around the globe um, and gain um, individual experience. If we look at, at other collaborations that Intel does, by working in our community with key stakeholders, we're able to proactively engage with local communities, as I said. And this allows us to manage the opportunity risk of operating in, in a particular environment. We're very open and transparent and have a dialogue about what we do. We bring the spirit of collaboration to work in, in the field of education. We work with the local governments, with the NGOs and the academics. We uh, recently, as, as noted here, made a $200 million investment in the US math and science education programs with the White House Math and Science Education Initiative. And we've committed to train 100,000 teachers in the US, maths and science teachers, that is, over the next three years. So globally, we are collaborating with other companies that you'll have heard of, like Cisco and Microsoft, um, leading universities, we're collaborating with them, with governments, um, to align education standards. Everybody's concerned about the standard of education in the United States. Um, and also collaborating on assessments to measure the attainment of the 21st century skills, such as problem solving and critical thinking that, that, that are required. So, Intel's had a long history in the corporate social responsibility arena. We publish a report every year. It's available on our website. Uh, here's the 2009 corporate responsibility report. Um, we're very open and transparent, which is important in today's age. You will find in here um, uh, the summary of key, key indicators, economic indicators, environmental indicators, social indicators, what's happened between 2005 to 2009. Uh, I'll just highlight one for you. Global warming emissions uh, measured in million metric tons of CO2 equivalents has been reduced from 3.78 in 2005 to 1.98 in 2009. 
we firmly believe that you can manage what you measure. So if we measure it, um, we can report it out and we are very transparent in our reporting here. CSR at Intel gets a lot of attention. It reports right up to the board level, to the governance and nominating committee of the board. Metrics in the Corporate Social Responsibility Program are tied to the employee's bonus at the end of the year. Um, so that tends to grab people's attention. If your compensation is, attain is tied to getting something done, uh, that, that tends to, to get attention. So uh, I'm enormously proud of what we do in this area. Um, we pay attention, we invest in people, we invest in the planet, and we know that the profit will follow, as has been seen for Intel for many years. And this year it's on track to have, uh, for the first time, over 40 billion in revenues. So as our CEO, Paul Ottolini, says, continuing our commitment to the highest performance in all we do, from product innovation to corporate responsibility, is in fact um, good business. At Intel, our commitment to innovation and corporate uh, responsibility dates back over 40 years to the founders of Intel, and it continues. It's not something, as I've said, that we treat as, a, as separate from our business and our day-to-day -day work. We work across the corporation to further integrate CSR into the business. From how we design our products, to how we work to mitigate the environmental impact of our operations, to how we create an ethical and inclusive workplace, uh, to how we proactively work with the communities in which we live and operate and governments. We're focused on continuous improvement and are always looking for opportunities to improve our performance as a leading corporate citizen. I think we've gathered a lot of the low-hanging fruit. I think our job ahead of us is going to be increasingly difficult um, based on the complexity of the issues that we face and the, the rising expectations. And I'd highlight there, particularly in the supply chain area and in political accountability. But I'll leave you, I hope, with the thought that Intel takes this issue very seriously. It's very much now part of corporate America, and I think Intel has taken great strides to lead the way. Uh, let, me, let me end there and say I would be very pleased to answer any questions uh, that you might have in the time that we have available. Thank you so much. Intel is a leader in technology as well as uh, corporate citizenship. Um, but Intel is designing electronics that use lots of energy, generate e-waste, and also uh, its usage uses lots of electricity also. Can you comment on the Intel's efforts um, improving energy efficiency and its use, its design, as well as manufacturing? I know it's a very loaded question, but I know many of our students are very, very passionate about the sustainability issue. It's a, it's a hugely important issue. And as I said, we, 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 it, it's at the forefront um, of, of all our product design um, and manufacturing activities to reduce uh, the energy required to produce our products and then to reduce um, the power consumption of your netbooks and your notebooks. It's what now um, limits, um, no, doesn't limit us. It's now the driving force. You know, you always used to look at a microprocessor and worry about its clock speed. That was the parameter that you used. That's not so anymore. Now, now the primary factor that you look at is power consumption. Everybody wants a device that they can carry around that will last for 12 hours at least before you have to, to recharge it. That's a very important parameter. So believe me, it's at the forefront of, uh, of, 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 um, of, of our activities. In our manufacturing plants, um, we, you can look in the Corporate Social Responsibility Report and look at how our energy requirements in manufacturing have decreased um, based on innovations made. Um, you can look at the, uh, well, I'll just, under environmental issues, I'll just 
tell you what we measure and report out. Energy use, that's electri uh, which includes electricity, gas and diesel, how that has decreased. Uh, water use, chemical waste, um, chemical waste that we've recycled, solid waste generated and solid waste recycled. So you can look at that and uh, we now recycle um, 80 to 88 percent of our solid waste. So there's a tremendous effort and you might say isn't that very costly? Um, that's the balance between what you do to be cost effective and also allow you to, to drive revenues. So constant issue. How about the e-waste issue, like, um, you know, like uh, recyclers sending uh, computers to um, like China and, um, the, you know, safety issues and health issues over there? Yes. Yeah, we, we, we're very careful about that. We don't move our e-waste to, uh, to foreign countries. Uh, we deal with it in the country in which it's generated. Um, my name is Stacy Gleixner. I'm a professor in chemical and materials engineering. You, you mentioned a little bit about working with Cisco and a couple of other companies. It seems like a couple of boards, just a small number of them working together on an issue could be a really significant voice. Um, so a kind of two-part question. Could you comment on the role of the board in political lobbying? And also, is there any kind of formal partnership with other boards on issues like health care, um, education, sustainability? Yes, so there are, I think, um, oh, I don't have the numbers in front of me. It's a great question. Um, first of all, with respect to political lobbying, we have an office in Washington, D.C. We have a PAC. Uh, board members contribute to the PAC and support the lobbying um, activity. Um, it's very important to do that, particularly in the communities in which we're strong in the United States, like Arizona, Portland, Oregon, um, and here in Santa Clara. Um, there are, Intel's part of many, many, many consortiums with, with industry, um, you know, setting standards um, for, um, uh, especially in the communications business, um, setting standards um, for, um, this is why as we publish these data we hope that, that, that what we've done in the area of corporate social responsibility will encourage other people uh, to work and reduce their, their footprint as well. Uh, many consortia as I touched on in the field of education, um, some are now forming in setting the standards in supply chain management and supply chain responsibility. Um, you're always careful about you don't want to be out in front, so it's very good to be working collaboratively with people, um, but of, often Intel is looked to, to, to take the lead um, in these activities, and, oft, and very often we're quite willing to do that. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's I, I read the number the other day in terms of, uh, there must be, I, it's well over 100 consortium associated with different aspects of our activity exist with respect to collaboration with other, with other industries. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my name is Tong Tran and uh, first I'd like to thank you guys for, you know, your sustainability. Um, one of my question is, Whenever I go to like friends' homes or family homes, I see like old desktops just mm. sitting there, some with Intel chips, of course. And um, I want to know if there's like a way f to get the message out, like, look, you know, it shouldn't belong in the corner or outside sitting in the rain. Is there like a way to kind of like do rebates or something to recycle them? I don't know. Because <laughs> I see a lot of them. Yeah, they're not, um, they're not particularly, uh, who wants a 10-year-old computer, you know? Um, I mean, when you, if you put it in the context of, of what was the size of the computer, to, you know, to put the man on the moon, um, you know, you could now carry it around in your, in your, in your notebook. I mean, it's, so that, that is the problem. You're right, there's a lot that sits around and it's a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue from, from a recycling point of view, but it needs to be done responsibly. Reusing is, is not really an asset. It's, uh, it's not really viable. You really need to get into, uh, into the recycling arena uh, rather than reusing, I think. 
Um, hello. Um, to touch on to that question, um, what is your opinion on the whole motion to have corporate responsibility for recycling? So is he saying basically these outdated equipment is now Intel's responsibility to recycle them? What's your opinion on that program? Well, it, it, it's not really, I mean, in, Intel can offer support and an avenue for recycling. It's not, we don't own that, you know, wherever it's sitting on somebody's desktop or in the industry or it's, 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 a, it's a property of an individual or a company. Um, but we can certainly provide the avenues for recycling, which is the approach that we take. Let me ask the last question here is Intel has been very successful for the past 40 years, now so the leader with over $40 billion re revenue, but we have students here who are thinking about that the career that they're going to ha start, and then we're talking about the maturity of the technology, the limit, reaching the limits of Moore's laws. So what's your advice for all students if they're interested in working in semiconductor and also they feel like Yes, with the impending maturity of the technology, what's your advice for them? Oh, I would say it's a very exciting field. And um, I wouldn't say, I think we're only just beginning. Moore's Law is nowhere near an end. Um, we have great visibility on extending Moore's Law um, for the next two decades. There's not, there's not a problem. Um, and in the meantime, there's a lot of focus in taking the technology into very different areas. So it's a very, very exciting field to be in. The roadmap for Intel is um, is pretty uh, is pretty amazing. Yes, you you know you tend to think of the technology as what's in your notebook and that's mature. But uh, I wonder how many people here have a smartphone, and how the smartphone can uh, does it connect? seamlessly to your computer? Um, where are you storing your information? Is it, in your, is it up in the cloud? Um, you know, there's, there's so many innovations going on in the world of, of computing, I think. Um, and Intel doesn't regard itself as a microprocessor company anymore. It is a computing company. And so I think there's a very bright future ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Jane. And we'll, and Shaw, we really appreciate the comment. Thank you, yeah. Sonia.